Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday at the Watering Hole. I'm Amy Nelson. I'm the coordinator of this webinar series and the editor of Biohabitat's publication, Leaf Litter. Uh, today's webinar is on the topic of common mistakes in dam removal. And with dams in America getting uh, a grade of D on the 2021 report card for America's infrastructure, with national infrastructure legislation in very recent headlines, um, with the IPPC report coming out and communities facing and uh, projected to face issues related to water supply and flooding and water quality, and with us being really at the beginning of what the UN has declared to be the decade on ecosystem restoration, the topic of dam removal is important and timely. So I'm really glad that you've chosen to, to join us today to talk about it. And I'm also very honored uh, to have my colleague present this webinar. Laura Wildman is a fisheries and wild uh, fisheries and water resources engineer. And Laura has a passion for restoring rivers and reestablishing natural function and aquatic connectivity. Laura is a leader at Biohabitat. She is both a practice lead and the leader of our Northeastern Highlands and Coastal Bioregion. And Laura is really regarded as a leading expert um, in the field of barrier removal and alternative fish passage techniques. And she's applied her expertise to hundreds of river restoration, dam removal, and fish passage projects. Um, she has done that both in the private sector and in the nonprofit world where she uh, served as chief engineer for American Rivers. And she has advised and spoken on this topic to audiences all over the world and we're really happy to have her today. Welcome, Laura. Uh, assisting Laura is Suzanne Haney. Suzanne is a senior ecological designer from Biohabitats. Uh, Suzanne has designed and implemented countless ecological restoration projects uh, on the East Coast and the Midwestern US. There's Suzanne and there's Laura. <laughs> uh, Suzanne's particular expertise is in the application of techniques modeled by nature's original ecological engineer, the beaver, to stream and river restoration. Uh, for now, it's time for me to stop talking and Laura to start talking. Uh, but before I let you go, and hopefully you won't see me until we're just about out of time, um, but before I let you go, you have to indulge me because I've done a lot of these webinars, but I never get to say this. Um, let's get this damn webinar started. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Amy. That was great. Um, okay, hopefully uh, all of you can see my screen. Um, I'm going to be talking about some common mistakes of dam removal today. I'm going to show a lot of different examples, um, all projects I'm familiar with, some that were my mistakes, some that were others. It's not about placing blame or anything like that. It's about all of us learning together and um, uh, figuring out how to do things better and understanding what are some of the common mistakes. This is also going to be a pretty interactive talk. Uh, we're going to go through polls. And as you see, a lot of the slides will have a poll. I'm going to ask a question. And it's going to be hard for you to answer it. There's just going to be one photo there and you have to kind of guess what went wrong on the project. Um, it, it's just just it's just to be interactive and to be doing something together don't worry no one's going to be graded or anything else on the polls it'll just be interesting to see what people have to say about the uh, different projects and issues okay let me try to advance my slide well i guess it's over here okay so first of all i'm going to start out with what i consider the number one um, most common mistake for a dam removal project and that is basically not removing the dam. Uh, often there seem to be insurmountable things that come up when you're doing a dam removal project. Historic issues, sediment concerns, water supply, flood attenuation issues. And too quickly often people feel like, okay, we can't remove it because of that. Whereas we, we really have learned a lot and there's a lot of things we can do to protect historic values and still remove a dam, to manage sediment, to find alternate water supplies, alternate forms of flood attenuation or modify the removal to allow for flood attenuation. So that's the first thing I just want to say is don't give up too early on it. And that's kind of teamed with the idea of quickly giving up and saying, that's all right. A fish weighs a win-win. It'll, it'll do the same thing. And while often we do have to go to fish ways if a dam can't be removed, 
Uh, it's not the same thing. It doesn't have the same kind of benefits that a dam removal does, not the overall restoration benefits. And a lot of recent studies have really shown some of the efficiency issues associated with uh, fishways. And just to talk about that a little bit farther, um, I like to compare that to kind of pedestrian bridges. This is a pedestrian bridge over the River Rhine. That's me on the bridge there too, but you can see a lot of uh, different folks on the bridge. And I think this is what we think we're gonna get when we have a fishway. We think we're gonna get older fish and younger fish and bigger fish and smaller fish and different species and everything else are gonna be able to go up the fishway and come down the river as well. And that's often not the case. We don't get that kind of passage. Sometimes it's a little closer to what we see over here on the right, which is more like a pedestrian bridge that some party individuals can get through. Uh, and surely not all life stages and not all, well, species or anything else on this. So um, a lot of times when a fishway goes in, we're really looking at um, a partial efficiency on passage anyway. And we're surely looking at partial restoration when it comes to all the other things a removal of a dam restores. So common mistakes, if we put them into some categories, we have ownership and outreach issues, we have sediment issues, modeling, geomorphic, design issues, restoration, regulatory and construction. And there are common mistakes or lessons learned in every single one of these categories. I've gone through here and the ones that you see the little star next to, those will be the ones we hit on a little bit more today but it doesn't mean that this list isn't a lot longer. And I will say, I put this list together with a handful of my colleagues, uh, some from other firms, some from other agencies, and some from NGOs, and we all just kind of brainstorm on, oh yeah, yeah, that one happens a lot. Yeah, I've seen that one too. And I do have that longer list. This is just kind of a, a bulleted list of that. So if we go into this very first example here, you can see the dam, we're, we're upstream looking downstream. Um, and I'd like you to take a guess at what went wrong on this project. Number, and there's gonna be a poll that comes up on your screen. Um, so hopefully this first one works and we'll see how it all goes. Um, what went wrong? Was the owner a hydro dreamer and wanted to add a turbine to the dam, therefore slowing down the dam removal process? Or did the owner read about the removal of, the, of his dam in the newspaper before he was even asked to remove it? Or did the owner go to prison during the project? Or D is both B and C. So if you can go into there and choose which one you think it is, I see the poll has been opened. Uh, hopefully you see it in your screen too, and you can just click on A, B, C, or D. And I'm seeing the percentages right now go up. Excellent. We've got about almost 80% voted now. And it looks like we're pretty overwhelmingly saying D, both B and C. So in this case, that is correct. That's exactly what happened. On this particular dam, um, it was a tragic mistake, and this was a project that I was involved in oh, in the mid-1990s, and it was really before we learned a lot about the outreach processes. And what happened is it was a big collaborative effort of a lot of state agencies, NGOs, uh, engineers like myself, and scientists involved that were all so excited. So a big newspaper article came out about the project and all the dams that we were looking at to potentially remove on this system. Uh, and this owner was furious when he found out, furious. No one had approached him at all. Now this is the kind of mistake we don't make as commonly anymore. Um, we, we realize that that's not the kind of information you wanna uh, read in the paper. Now, it just so happens that that same dam owner did end up going to prison at the end of the project. No one has since, or, I mean, they're still working on this all these years later, there's still projects going on on this, um, parts of this project going on. No one has reapproached the new owner. Um, so that might be an option now to reconsider approaching an owner in a better way. Let me go forward on here. Here's another uh, case study here. 
And I want you to say, I know it's hard to tell, but you can see again, you see an aerial photo. The dam is kind of uh, central to the left. Uh, you've got a lot of homeowners around it. You see a picture of the dam here from, uh, from Google. And now I want you to talk about what we, and a lot of these, by the way, I'm not gonna mention the name of the dam or even where it is. Some of these are confidential. But what went wrong on this one? So, A, each half of the dam was owned by someone else. B, the abutters, that means the lake abutters, owned the land all the way to the center of the pond. C, the abutters had an option to take over dam maintenance in their deeds, or D, all of the above. So we're gonna open a poll for this. And let me know which you think. Okay, we're getting pretty overwhelmingly high on D all of the above and that is true it is all of the above on this one i want to say that a is very common so we run into this a lot that the dam isn't owned by one entity but it's owned by two this obviously complicates the project you have to deal with two different owners two different issues in this case the landowners around the lake also open own to the center of the lake um that is an issue especially once you're dewatering and what that means as far as um access and everything else and then on c um uh this was a unique uh, a non-common issue is that the abutting landowners did have deeded rights to maintain the dam um on in their deeds so that made this one extra complicated so now let's go to the next okay how about on this one so on this one you can see the current extent of the impoundment, I've got the dam labeled there, got the river coming in, and what went wrong? A, the extent of the impounded sediment was underestimated. B, the mobility of the impounded sediment was underestimated. Or C, the extent of the impact was underestimated. Or D, all of the above. So the poll's gonna come out. I think what likely happened on this site Okay, we're again seeing overwhelming on D here, and that is correct, although I will say this one's somewhat theoretical because the dam hasn't come out yet. Uh, so it's more like what could have happened, and I'm gonna explain what could have happened. It could have easily been underestimated and thought that the impoundment was just this area that we see in blue here. While in fact, the original impoundment extended quite a bit farther upstream, and all of this other area, this terrestrial, looking like terrestrial area with mature trees on it, uh, is actually part of the delta uh, that came in, the sediment delta that came into the impoundment. And as I started doing probes up this side channel here, what looked kind of like the, the well, the main channel coming in, but it was over to the side, um, it looked like I was just getting normal depths, normal depths, until I got to about here, and I hit very consolidated material and I thought, okay, this is it. I'm probably at the upper extent of the impounded sediment. But then I burst through that crust and there was a bunch of impounded sediment under it because that was a coarse grain delta that went on top of the finer, ground, uh, finer grain bottom set deposits in the impoundment. And what we really found out from the sediment probing is that it extended all the way upstream. So it's somewhat theoretical in the sense that we didn't have these problems, but if that had been done, that's exactly what would have happened. We would have underestimated the amount of impounded sediment, the amount of impacts that were going to be ha had and the amount of mobility of the impounded sediment. So now if we go to the, oh, yep, it's just kind of showing the impounded sediment and the extent there. Okay, now this is a pretty famous dam removal. So you guys might know this one. This is the Fort Edwards Dam in New York. And it's pretty famous, so I did put the actual uh, name of it on here. And now, what went wrong on this project? They didn't test the sediment before removal. That's A. B, they released PCBs downstream. C, they tested the sediment but the PCBs were a relatively unknown contaminant at the time. 
or D, both B and C. So we're going to open a poll, see what you guys know about this particular site. So that's pretty impressive. We're seeing a, a large percentage of the folks uh, um, voting for D here. And I say that's impressive because when I first heard about this project way back when, I did think it was A. I thought it was A. I thought they didn't test the sediment before removal. And that's obviously kind of a rookie mistake, something you really need to do. But then I got to know the people who had been involved in this project. And this project had been done a while ago. I forget exactly the date, but it was it was a while ago. It was maybe in the 70s um, or 80s, but I, it, it was before I was removing dams. And they did release an enormous amount of PCB downstream, and there's a large uh, cleanup issue uh, associated with that. But in fact, they did test the sediment. They did test the sediment. They test the sediment for all the types of contaminants that they knew could be a problem. But at the time, PCBs were relatively unknown. So we need to think this through too as we're removing dams because there are always new contaminants that we're running into. Like right now, PFOS is becoming a really big one. That wasn't a really big one just 10 years ago. There might be some other type of contaminant that we are releasing right now, not realizing its impacts on the environment. And it could be built up behind dams. So this is more of a, a, a warning that this kind of thing can happen. We're learning more and more about environmental impacts all the time. Let's go to the next one here. Okay, this one also um, uh, was a little bit better known. It's one in New York. Um, and what went wrong on this project? So on this project, I know it's very hard to tell from the photos on these. So in a sense, we're guessing, or maybe you know of the project, but um, did they forget to quantify the amount of sediment behind the dam? Or did the previously be, was it, the previously determined sediment quantities were inaccurate due to the length of time between the assessment and the removal, or C, that all of this resulted in more sediment released downstream than predicted. So our D is both B and C. So we go to our poll. Votes are coming in very heavy on D at this point. I mean, we're 100, oh, almost 100% on D there, almost 100% on D. So, and it is D. Um, so on this one, there were more sediments released downstream than had been predicted in the analysis. But there was a lag between when the sediment was quantified and when the dam was removed. Uh, I think there could still be some debate about exactly what happened, but basically um, some folks say that there had been um, a geomorphic, um, kind of like a landslide type thing upstream that brought a lot more sediment in, in between that time period. So by the time it went to construction, there was a lot more sediment released. And I think this is a good warning um, for folks uh, to be careful of these type of time lags, and that if there is a time lag like this, to make sure that you go in and reassess the quality and quantity of sediment before the dam is removed. Okay. Next one, okay. This is the Zemco dam removal in Connecticut. Uh, and when I say what went wrong, of course, all these projects didn't go wrong. They all went really well in the end. I mean, Fort Edwards, that was a pretty significant problem with PCBs, but a lot of the rest of these were just things that were ironed out during the course of the project um, and are really lessons learned. So let's say what wrong on this one. We see the model for this site right here. So A says the model, this is the hydraulic model, HECRAS model. A, the model was not extended far enough upstream to determine the upstream extent of the impoundment and impacts. B, the fully dated delta at the upstream end of the impoundment mobilized post removal. C, dewatering the impoundment prior to dam removal was not needed and just extended the construction period or D, all of the above. So we got the poll open here. Seeing more mix of results here. 
Uh, and yet most folks voted for D, all of the above, and I can understand why they might have thought that, but it is not in this case, it is A. Um, it's pretty obvious from the model. Um, see, if you can see the water surface elevation is still dead flat in all the flows modeled at the upstream end of the impoundment. That means they really haven't gotten to the upstream end of the impoundment yet. So the model is definitely not extended far enough upstream. Although the fully vegetated delta at the upstream end that really then was thought to not be within the impoundment, but it is, uh, didn't mobilize. It did not mobilize on this project. Um, we had mobilization throughout this other area, but we didn't have mobilization of that area, partly because they took out the dam, but put a, a bit of a sill in at the end. And then C, the dewatering of the impoundment actually prior to the dam's removal was really wonderful. Um, this was a very hard site as far as constructability. Uh, it was really easy to sink almost right up to your neck. And uh, dewatering the site ahead of time really helped, made it a little more constructible, and it also brought that vegetation in and that root mass in. So that was actually a real benefit. And if we, I think I have a little bit animated on this slide too. So here again, that's where you see the flat water surface elevation showing that the model wasn't extended far enough upstream. Also, I might add, uh, there was some sediment analysis on this and there was an initial error that was then corrected that didn't really remove the mobile portion of the sediment before running uh, what they're, they were doing for sediment modeling, which was a cross-section, cross-sectional sediment modeling. So it was overestimating the amount of sediment because of that. Um, that would even become mobile because it was actually keep, kept on showing a big drop right over the impounded sediment. So that's another important thing, lesson learned on any of these projects when you're running your proposed model to take out the mobile portion of the impounded sediment in the proposed model run to really get better water surface elevations, shear stress, and potential sediment mobility um, assessment. So next. Okay, this is a dam. I don't actually even know the name of this particular dam removal, but it was in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts DER uh, uses this picture a lot in their, um, in their presentation. So does uh, American Rivers. That's why I'm familiar with it. And what went wrong here? So A, aquatic connectivity was not restored. B, the dam sill was left in place and became exposed. C, the stream bed degraded downstream, or D, all of the above. So we will start the poll for this one. About 40% of you voting so far, 50. Okay, but we're starting to see pretty overwhelmingly folks voted for D here. That is the correct answer here. Um, aquatic connectivity was obviously not fully restored. They didn't take out the sill of the dam. Now, I will say that it looked like they had taken out what they needed when they finished the removal. That was the riverbed grade. So they thought, okay, that's as much as we need to take out. But that wasn't the case. And then it became the full sill became exposed. This often happens when you leave a sill of a dam in because the hydraulics then continue and then expose the sill. This has happened on a few projects, and it's why when we're working with contractors, we're normally very careful to see them dig below, take the full sill of the dam out uh, before leaving the site. I would say this is a very common error and, and one we're always watching out for on projects. And it's not just a common engineering error, it's a common contractor's error too, because they think they've removed the extent of what they need to already, and they really haven't gone deep enough. Okay, here's another one. Um, this project, again, has not happened yet. So this was, um, this is what went wrong with kind of an initial assessment, an initial um, uh, design that was put out years before um, and is not the current uh, design approach. So what went wrong on this? You see where the dam is, and that's, we have a profile down below. Uh, that red dashed line up by the dam, that's the extent of their profile there. You see the flow direction, and then you see a picture of the dam on the left-hand corner there. So what went wrong? A, no sediment probes were conducted, and sediment depths were not shown on the plans. B, 
The concept design tried to hold back the deep sediment with a surfacing of stone. C did not identify the likely impacts to the upstream road crossing, that's the concept design, or D, all of the above. So we'll open the poll on that. Okay, we're getting pretty, pretty hefty on our guesses for D. Uh, you'll see that I uh, maybe have a preference towards the all of the above. <laughs> um, and it is all of the above on this one. So on this project, as you can see from the profile, well, you can't quite see from the profile, but let me, let me show you a little bit more. They have the dam on the profile. Uh, they have the top of sediment on the profile. And then they have their proposed grade. Um, but what they, and then the amount, that's the sediment that's coming out. So that hashed area, that's the sediment that's coming out. And they propose basically, um, you know, just working in this area right here. That's what this entire profile is. It just shows this area here where the red dashed line is. Um, what this means, because they didn't do the sediment probes and sediment depths all the way up. Um, the actual sediment depths extended, the actual impounded sediment extended quite a bit farther upstream. Um, and they did not account for kind of the mobility of the rest of the impounded sediment in there on the profile. Um, because of this, they also didn't go far enough upstream to see where we might have infrastructure impacts. The impounded sediment actually goes all the way up to the road crossing and even to some degree a little bit of impounded sediment on the other side of it. So now you have to talk about potential mobility of the sediment through that whole system there and look at the impacts on that road crossing as well. Now this, believe it or not, is one of the most common errors that I've seen on dam removal project designs. And because of that, I'm going to go on to another slide to explain this one more time, kind of conceptually instead. Here we have a dam. We have a dam, we have impounded sediment back behind it. We have the water, the impoundment. In this case, we even have a bridge upstream with a footing on the impounded sediment and then pilings going down in. But maybe you didn't know this at the time. You just knew there was a bridge there. Now you wanna take out the dam. You don't wanna impact the bridge so what some folks have a tendency to do is only remove a wedge of the impounded sediment and then basically armor that that ramp so they take out a wedge of the impounded sediment and they armor that ramp with either riprap or a layer of rounded stone placed at a slope that fish can go up but the problem is, in a sense, you're just creating, you're trying to create another dam, but you're not creating another dam that would be stable um, because this can't possibly, it's not even tied into underlying material up here. This can't possibly hold back the rest of this impounded sediment. And what you will get, you will get seepage through here, you'll get breaking a part of this, and at some point you will get a full head cut going up. And in this case, when you have infrastructure upstream, you have the potential undermining of a bridge foundation that is set on timber piles. So again, it's kind of a common mistake to think that you can just kind of ramp up at a slope passable by fish, put some little surface weirs on top of impounded sediment and hold back impounded sediment um, in that way. And it, it's, just, it's just not gonna work. Structurally, that's just not gonna work. That's a very common error. I call this, I've, I've coined the phrase and I doubt it will ever um, uh, take over because no one gets what I'm talking about when I say this. I, I talk about the chocolate dip dipped ice cream cone example. And basically to me, this example is like if you had an ice cream cone and you dipped it in chocolate and that was a little crust on top and you were out on a hot day and you expected that little crust of chocolate on top to stop the ice cream from melting down the cone and into your hand. Uh, it won't, it won't. Obviously it will go around it, it will go under it, it'll, it'll melt no matter what. And because of that, this type of approach 
seriously underestimates the quantity um, of the mobile impounded sediment and the downstream and upstream impacts. Here's another site, and on this one, you can see um, you can see the dam being removed. You can see a lot of stuff uh, relating to the bridge. So let's talk about what happened here. Uh, what went wrong? The designer forgot to determine the bridge foundation depth. Or B, the railroad bridge foundation was unknown, was undetermined. Well, what is that? Forgot to determine. That, that seems very similar. Okay. Um, uh, Undermined. Okay, sorry, I'm just reading the wrong words here. I, I can't even read my own spelling. <laughs> so B is the railroad bridge foundation was undermined. A was the designer forgot to determine the bridge foundation depth. And C, the contractor hit the bridge with the excavator. And D, both A and B. Let's see what we got here. Okay, we've got some good voting. A lot of folks going for D right now. I love to watch the little um, dial go up. Yeah, I think we got solid on D here. And that's exactly it. And, and the main thing I wanna point out with this one is um, the designer, actually, no, I wrote down the wrong one here. Wait, no, designer forgot to do Okay, actually, I wrote down the wrong one here. It's not It's not D. I, I didn't write it down. I probably haven't read on my notes, but I was saying it was D. It's actually not D. So that's what I want to point out here. It's just B on this one. It's just B. So the designer didn't forget to determine the bridge foundation depth. That's what you would think happened here because the bridge, yes, did become undermined during construction. The designer um, did everything they could. They did probes. They had plans. They, they thought they were certain the plans showed that this went down into bedrock and that this bridge's pier was founded in bedrock. But the bridge was undermined. And I think this really gets back to not having as built plans. A lot of times we're lucky if we even get bridge plans and we rarely get as built plans. So as it was, even though they really thought this was secured into bedrock, once construction happened, uh, the very bottom of it was not secured into bedrock. And because of that, they had to hold up the railroad bridge and they had to, with these, these structures here, and they had to go in and replace that foundation of the railroad bridge. So actually it's only B here. And the contractors didn't hit that because they were careful. So again, sometimes even with the best design team and the best contractors, we just don't always have great data. And, and then when we think we got really good data like plans, um, without knowing as built or having plans of when things were built, even if it was hundreds of years ago, uh, we just never quite know. So, but it wasn't, it wasn't in any um, a forgetfulness. They knew that this could be an issue and they thought they had solved that ahead of time. So sorry about me running through that kind of oddly. Okay. This is one I find really fun. And uh, this one's just kind of a prepare for the unexpected. So, um, and I know a few of you have seen my talks before, you probably know this one, but I still just find it fascinating. So this is a dam site and these pictures here were taken off uh, Google Earth. And standing next to the dam, there's the, the dam down below. So this, this upper picture is kind of standing over here, looking up into the impoundment. It's not a very high dam, it's like six foot high. And looking up, you think, okay, this is gonna be a pretty slam dunk dam removal project. Might need to do some bank work, but shouldn't be that hard. And then all of a sudden, one of the abutting property owners came out with a history book, um, a village called Brave. And in that history book, in that history book, if you can go online and order the book if you like, but, um, in that history book, there was a picture of this exact site. And here's what the picture showed. And what this is, is this is pretty much the same location looking upstream and you see them building something in the riverbed. And what they are building is around turn of the century, they are building what was at the time the world's largest, basically radiator. Um, so it was for a gas pumping station. It was a cooling system. Uh, and it was a matrix of pipes in the bottom of the river. 
So the question I'm going to ask you on this one, this project by the way never did go forward. So this is again um, uh, just informational, but it, it just shows you the kind of things that can show up. The question I want to ask you is, do you think they took out the radiator when they were done using it? Or do you think it's still there? So A is going to be, yeah, they took out the radiator because industries are always responsible environmental stewards. Or B, it is still there rotting in place within the impoundment. So I'm curious what you guys think. And when I say they took it out, I mean the industry once they finished using it. Because again, this dam has not been taken out. So it looks like we have kind of an overwhelming, it's still there. And of course, you're right, it is. So that material's still there. It's been under the water now for 100 years. And when you're trying to predict how to take out iron pipes from the bed of a river that are likely in some stage of rotted condition, this gets pretty darn complicated. I would love to see this project move forward someday in the future and, uh, and you know, have to deal with this complex problem here or have someone see how someone else deals with this complex problem. So that's that one. Here's another one. This project's pretty famous. So again, I do say the name of it here is this is San Clemente Dam Removal in California. Um, large, large scale project, a lot of different components, very complex. I helped with the uh, technical oversight um, on this, but, but nothing else. There was a large group of us on the technical oversight team. Um, but I do think this is really interesting. The picture to the left shows you the design and what was implemented for the channel work. For the channel work, there was a diversion of flows in this. So that is the channel work. And then on the right is a picture of that same site one year later. So let's ask the question, what went wrong? The design was overprescribed, that's A. B, large flows rearranged the channel post-construction. C, Mother Nature had a different design concept. And D, all of the above, all of the above. So let's get to that poll. Thank you, Amy, for getting these polls up so quickly. Okay, it looks like we're pretty overwhelming on D here, and that is true. I will tell you there was a lot of discussion on this project. There was a lot of discussion of, of whether the best approach would just be to mess up the area, or like explode, over excavate, and then let the channel do its own thing, or whether we needed to do more prescribing. Um, I can tell you a lot of the final decisions weren't just the designer's decisions. It came from regulatory, it came from all the partners involved, and in the end it was decided to go with a more prescribed approach. Um, I'd say now, if we had all the data and we knew that, um, we probably would have gone with a much less prescribed approach. We would have gone with something more that just kind of mixed it up, gave the channel kind of the building blocks to work with and let it do its own thing. But fish passage was a very big deal here. And it's scary to take those kind of risks and let the river do the design instead. I'm very a strong proponent of letting the river do the design itself, but it is very hard to fit that into all of our agencies and our regulatory and, and design thought process. So let's go to the next one here. This is the Union City Dam. This is one I was involved in probably like 30 years ago. And let's talk about what went wrong. And I know, again, it's hard to tell from the pictures, uh, but you can't see the dam there and you can't see a pipe upstream. So what went wrong? A. The abandoned pipe resulted in an unraveling of the upstream riverbed. B, regulatory permits did not allow adaptive management. C, upstream infrastructure was damaged. Or D, both A and B. Get that poll open. See what you guys think. Got a big front runner on D, although we're getting a lot of points on B too. Okay, I think we've got kind of the eyes have it for D right now, both A and B, and that is correct. Um, 
But the, the lesson learned really is B, is these regulatory permits did not allow adaptive management. So it wasn't an active pipe, it was abandoned, it wasn't on any kind of maps. The probes didn't pick it up, you can only do so many probes. Sometimes you don't realize um, that something like that's down there, you know, the probes didn't hit right on it, where you couldn't tell the difference between, let's say, the top of a pipe or just the riprap on top of it. So it became exposed after the dam was removed and it would have been great and we had the equipment right there to just run up and take that pipe out could have easily been done but it wasn't in the regulatory permits to have our limit of disturbance go that far upstream so unfortunately there couldn't be a quick response we should have built in a more adaptive uh, limit of disturbance to deal with infrastructure issues so because of that it took a few weeks before we got permission to go and notch that pipe. By that time, the hydraulics over the pipe had created a big enough scour hole below the pipe that it started a head cut going upstream. It could have easily damaged upstream infrastructure if there was upstream infrastructure to damage on this one. But the head cut wasn't that extreme and that, that structure that you see farther upstream here actually was a full span, I think a pipe going across as well, but full span. So it didn't damage anything. It just created a longer period of time for the site to really kind of restore itself. But it was definitely a, a lesson learned in adaptive management on permits. Here's another site, okay? Now, for any of you familiar with Connecticut, you'll realize the Rainbow Dam, as shown in the arrows there, has not been taken out yet. So this is kind of theoretical theoretically. Um, so what went wrong here? The dam breached prior to removal and undermined a sewer line. B, an unknown legacy dam was found upstream. C, high flows washed away the access route. And D, both A and C. I guess I've kind of given away the answer here by how I told you this was theoretical. Probably should have hold, held on to that one myself. So Oh, maybe I didn't give it away. We're getting a mix. I think you all think that I'm just gonna always say D here, right? We're getting mixed. Okay, so the answer here is B. Uh, the dam didn't breach prior to removal and undermine a sewer line, although another one of my projects did, um, the Anaconda Dam, that actually did breach prior to removal and undermine the sewer line. Um, on the Rainbow Dam, since it hasn't been taken out yet, so we didn't have any um, access road, um, go away. We have a legacy dam behind the rainbow dam. And I just think I had some good pictures for this and I wanted to show this particular legacy dam. It is a large legacy dam. That photo right there is called the Oil City Hydroelectric Plant Dam. And it is fully submerged within the impoundment and only visible during low flows that you can kind of see from this aerial map. I fully submerged under almost all other flow conditions. This is, I wouldn't say a common mistake, as much as a common occurrence. We find so many legacy dams above dams. On the Penobscot dams, both the Great Works and the VZ, there were huge legacy dams just upstream of the dams we removed. So the removal didn't just become the removal of Great Works and VZ dams, it was the removal of those dams plus notching these legacy dams upstream. This is so common. I would say maybe about 50% of my projects, 40% of my projects have had some kind of legacy dam structure, just at the upstream face or within the impoundment. So it's something to really keep your eyes open for. Now on this project, what do you think went wrong here? We can see that something definitely went wrong or is going wrong in the photo. So what went wrong? A, the design was unconstructible. B, the site needed more time to dewater prior to initiating upstream work. C, swamp mats were never found. Or D, all of the above. Getting some good voting in, getting a lot on B. I think we're getting mainly B on this one. Folks are saying the site needed more time to do water prior to initiating upstream work. That's very true. Clearly it did. But a lot of designs are unconstructible as well. Um, 
And the example I'm using here, this picture is actually of a different site, but I have a very similar picture of the, the actual site. It was both an issue associated with really the design not being as constructible as it should have been, uh, the site needing more time to do water, and not only did they almost lose the machines, they tried to use swamp mats and they vanished and were never found. So it is a pretty common to not think through all of these things well enough on dam removal projects. Um, swamp mats are great, but on some sites, you really need to give it that time to dewater and stabilize more. You have to think of this when you're thinking of constructability on dam removal designs. Okay, next one. Here on this site, this is during construction, what went wrong? A, unknown rebar reinforcing was found in the core of the dam. B, removing the rebar proved challenging. C, a change order was requested because the reinforcing was not mentioned on the plans or specifications, or D, all of the above. Getting left for D, all of the above, and I will say it is D, all of the above. Um, this is one of, one of my projects uh, early on, again, back in the 1990s, and um, you know, we didn't know if it was reinforced or not. So we didn't say that the dam was reinforced. Um, now, I almost always, when we don't know if the dam is reinforced, I state that it is reinforced because I'd rather have the more conservative assumption. And I also state that we don't know what that reinforcing is, that that reinforcing might be rebar, it might be sheet pile, it might be old railroad ties. It could be a variety of things. But we're looking to cost estimate out projects when we have an unknown like that in more the worst case scenario, because it did prove very difficult to remove the rebar in this scenario, and a change order, of course, was requested and granted, you might add on that. Here's another project down in a deep bedrock gorge. Um, and what do you think went wrong? That's my friend Eileen Fielding there. What went wrong? The a large flood, A, trapped the equipment in the river. B, concrete excavation took longer than expected due to the strength of the concrete. C, the excavator fell off the dam. Or D, both A and C. What do you think? Got about half of you voting so far. We don't have to wait for 100%, but let me at least wait for a handful more because we're getting a real nice mix on this one. This is a tricky one. Um, and we have the majority of folks voting for D, saying both A and C. It isn't what happened. Uh, A and C did not happen, but you could see where they might. This is a gorge, and if you didn't plan well for high flows, you could see where you might get equipment trapped in the river that didn't happen. The uh, excavator actually worked really well right on top of the dam. There was so much concrete and it was so big that the dam itself became really the full access across the river, which was wonderful. And they were nice and stable. Um, but B did happen, and this is common, okay? Contractors are used to contract uh, concrete that has been cured out of water. Concrete that has been cured in water is often a lot harder. So a lot of these dams where they, they built the dams and cured the concrete in water um, are really, really strong. The concrete in them is really strong. So I can think of, I could probably count on both, we take both hands to count the, the number of times we've worked on a project with slowdowns because it was harder to break into the contract of uh, the concrete than any of the con uh, tractors thought it would be. So that's the kind of lesson learned on that one. Here's another one. This one is a very well-known project, um, a, a well-known um, incident that happened on a dam removal project. This is the Browns Bridge Dam Removal on the Boardman River in Michigan. And what went wrong? How many of you know this story? The sheet pile used for water control during construction failed. That's A. B, a $6.3 million lawsuit was filed 
due to the downstream property damage. C, this mistake stopped all future dam removals on the Boardman Dam, or D, both A and B. Laura, this is Amy. The poll function is, I think we burned it out. So. Okay. Well, then I'll just go through. I'll tell you. I don't think we have many more polls left anyway. Um, so on this one, uh, again, pretty famous case. It was the sheet pile that was used for water control had a failure uh, during construction. Uh, there was a significant amount of damage downstream and there was a lawsuit. But this didn't stop all the, all the future dam removals on the Boardman River. They moved on and had other very successful projects. This project itself was very successful in the long run, the overall removal, but clearly not successful as far as predicting impacts and dealing with downstream properties. So not a full success, but the river has now had, I believe, at least three dams come out of the Boardman River and the river itself is restoring itself quite well. So now, oh, you know what? That was our last poll anyway, I think, Amy. So that was good timing. Um, just some quick tips from a contractor on the Zemco site. The Zemco site, we put it out to bid, about three contractors came out and only one bid, only one gave us a price. And this was a long time ago, years and years ago, like 15 years ago. And one price, and it was expensive, it was way more than we thought it was gonna be, but we only had one contractor bid on it, so we used them. And everything went fine, the project went fine, but after it was over, I decided, I said, hey, will you go out to lunch, and can we talk about why you made so much money on this project? Because it went pretty easy, and your bid was really high. I think you made a lot of money. He goes, yeah, you're right, I did make a lot of money on this one. And he gave me some tips to help those of us trying to make these projects more cost effective uh, at that lunch. Our first mistake is when we put the project out to bid. You should put a project out to bid in the winter when the contractor doesn't have a full plate. We put it out to bid when all the contractors had full plates. Okay, that's gonna make it more expensive right there. We had tons of people at the pre-bid meeting, tons of people at the pre-bid meeting, and it made it look like the project was a big deal. We had partners saying things like, oh, this one's gonna be a real tough one. Oh, permits on this one were really hard. The regulator's gonna be down here all the time. It freaked out the contractors, you know, it freaked them out. So they put in a higher bid and actually probably why the other two folks, two contractors walked away. He also mentioned on certain things that we call out that are kind of weird or unusual for contractors like root wads or things like that that they might not have used before, that we should use photos too. Show, show them photos of these things at the pre-bid meeting um, or even put them on the plan so that they can visualize what needs to be done and they didn't realize it's this you know otherwise they have no idea what price to put in for a reward and they're getting more comfortable with these now like i said this was um 15 20 years ago um and another thing in general and this really is to everyone is don't try to shift all the responsibility over to the contractor uh, when there are a lot of unknowns and you leave them as unknowns and you shift all that responsibility to the contractor they have to give you the price for the worst case scenario now that was that contractor and that lunch and I really enjoyed that, but I've gotten so much good advice from contractors over the years. I'm gonna put a few more tips that I've got. Check quantities twice or even three times or four times. Dewater the impoundment ahead of time if possible. Determine the sediment disposal site ahead of time and let the contractors know this. They might not choose to use it. They might find something even cheaper, but this is gonna help you get better prices than them trying to figure this out in the short period of time where they're trying to put a cost and a bid together. Stage the construction such that you only excavate the sediment once. We had one site where the contractor took out all the sediment that needed to be managed, but left the dam up at the height that it was supposed to be because he was gonna notch it the next day. And he came back out, we had a storm overnight and the whole thing was full of sediment again. So we got a change order for that. Um, have sediment testing uh, results available for the contractors during the bidding process and include the time of year restrictions on the plans. And this is my last little bit of advice here, although like I said, there are a lot of other lessons learned and a lot of other mistakes that have been made that hopefully we don't have to make again. And this is don't forget about the wood. 
So this is tricky. I have a good example of this. I just couldn't find it quick enough. It's an example from a friend of mine, Jim McBroom, where he was taking out a dam and they had quantified all this sediment and how they were going to remove it with mechanical measures. And it ended 90% wood. And it was a lot harder to take out than they had thought to, to take out wedge, in this case, of sediment out. And they were going to let the rest mobilize on its own. Um, so don't forget about wood. If the system is heavily wood dominated, it can cause all sorts of issues. It can be challenging to remove. It can cause a benefit. You might be able to take that wood and reuse it for something else. Uh, it can cause, you can move what might be a log jam at the dam currently to a downstream location that then becomes an issue, much like relocating an ice jam. So I just want to warn people to, to kind of think about the wood issue while they're thinking about these dam removal projects. And I want to point out at the very end of this that we've been talking a lot about mistakes or things that went wrong on dam removal projects. But again, here's what really can go wrong when we don't remove dams that are aging. Uh, when we have aging dams that aren't kept up to safety codes and everything else, we have horrific dam failures. And we saw that, of course, in Michigan uh, just last year and the enormous amount of damage that was caused by those two dam failures. We've got the, uh, the dam here in Nebraska in 2019, dam failure. I've got another example down here in Iowa from 2010, dam failure. The other one on the bottom corner in 2002 is one in Germany. I just included that one because it really shows you the process of failure of an earthen dam being overtopped. But this is what failure really looks like. These other things are less mistakes and more lessons learned. And those of us that have learned the lessons would now like everyone else to know them so they're not mistakes made in the future. And that's it for my slides. Is there a particular season that's best for dam removal? Is there a particular season that's best for dam removal? I like to remove dams when the flows are low. It makes it a lot easier to do the dam removal with less water controls and more control of the site when the flows are low. That being the case, though, it's not always the appropriate time. We have to look at um, uh, restrictions uh, relating to, you know, fish, relating to bird habitat, bat habitat. We're recently getting a lot of that. So we have to know those time of year restrictions and we have to go with the open windows that we have. Uh, in addition, there are some dams that have been removed purposely in higher flow conditions or right before higher flow conditions because they want sediment to flush through the system quickly after the dam is removed. So, so we do see a variety there, but I think probably the most common, especially for small dam removals, is to work in the low flow period. Okay, thank you very much for the first question. Um, the next question is, what is the maximum amount of time that you would be comfortable with between your sediment and assessment and the removal of said sediment? Yeah, now that, that's a really good question. I mean, really, I'd be more comfortable with like the year before. The year before construction, you've done the sediment, um, probing, testing, and, and then you're removing. If it's a little longer than that and you haven't seen any significant changes to the system, like, you know, there wasn't any um, landslides upstream or real like, you know, 100 year events or 500 year flow events, these kind of things. Um, if things were relatively calm on the front, you know, then I could see you going a little bit longer, maybe even as long as five years. I think probably anything outside of five years, though, you're starting to say, well, what might have changed? Um, I would I would then start even if you didn't see any big events happen, I would at least do some double checks to, to verify that your sediment quantity and quality are, are the same. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question from a participant was, if what, can you please define what exactly a legacy dam is? Yeah, so a legacy dam is really just a dam that's submerged somewhere within the impoundment. So, We've got the dam itself that we're looking at, um, but a legacy dam would be one that was built at an earlier time and is either just underneath the dam, just upstream of the dam. Sometimes, you know, 
they start building it basically just on the downstream face of the old dam. So then we call the legacy dam the one that's remaining just upstream. But sometimes these legacy dams are farther up in the impoundment, like the one we saw on the example I gave. And in that case, you really can be surprised that, wow, I had no idea a half mile upstream within the impoundment, there was a full fledged dam that was submerged by the new dam they put in. They often did this because why take that dam out? They're thinking to themselves, why take that out? It's gonna be water control and help me while I'm building this next dam. And then it's gonna be submerged later because my new dam is even bigger. So it is just not uncommon at all that we find these submerged structures upstream on uh, dam removal projects. Okay. Um, our next question from the participants is, if the bottom of a bridge, and I would say word this two different ways, one, the low cord of a bridge, and two, the bottom of the foundation of the bridge, is at a higher elevation than the top of a dam, should we expect to take probings all the way upstream to the bridge? Yeah, yeah. so the low cord's going to make almost no difference, obviously. Um, uh, so, yes, uh, low cord could be, you know, right at the dam face, could be up higher. That's not going to make much of a difference. So I assume what they're asking by this is they mean the bottom of the dam, the bottom of the foundation of the abutments and the central piers. And they're saying if that is higher than the crest of the dam, if that bottom of the foundation of the bridge is higher than the crest of the dam, do you really need to go all the way up to that? Uh, maybe, maybe, and here's why maybe, because your impoundment is not defined simply by the crest of the dam projecting back and where it hits the ground. It is um, defined hydraulically um, and you will have high storms. You could have high storms that are easily create a water surface elevation that goes way above, way, way higher uh, in elevation on the water surface elevation than the bottom of that bridge. And the changes when you take out the dam could still increase scour. So it's a matter of really the hydraulics of what's happening at that bridge. And you need to look at the full range of flows. Um, so you can have a bridge that has a pier hitting, let's say bedrock, and it is above the elevation of the dam, um, well, let's not say bedrock, because if it's on bedrock, you're, pretty, you're in pretty good condition. But let's say it hits, you know, the channel and it's above the elevation of the dam. But then hydraulically, when you take the dam out, you could still have impacts on that structure. So what you have to do is not think of a dam as being defined by the crest of its dam projected upstream. You have to look at a water surface profile and the changes to the water surface profile under the flows you're concerned with because you can have sediment dropped out higher than that because it's that hydraulic change that starts dropping the sediment out. So both in higher flows and, and lower flows, so. The last question is, do you always end up with a single thread channel after you remove a dam? So no, we don't, and we shouldn't even try. So some river systems are single thread, some are not. Um, and with a dam removal, we have to try to restore a healthy dynamic river system, healthy dynamic river system. And that's going to be both a longitudinal restoration, a lateral restoration, and even a vertical restoration. So we have to contemplate all those things when we're looking at a dam removal and try to add complexity and habitat value and natural function, whichever way we can. Sometimes that is going to mean a single threaded channel um, in, you know, especially a V-shaped valley, bedrock dominated, you know, it very well might be a single threaded channel in that case. But we are also going to have a lot of cases where that wouldn't be the case. And we don't want to default to that. We want to understand what a healthy functioning dynamic river system would look like through that system and work to restore that. Okay, thank you very much. And um, everybody who's listening in, I hope you have a great rest of the day. And thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.